Who is your daddy and what does he do? That's my question. Who is your daddy and what does he do? I haven't seen anybody seen kindergarten. I haven't seen kindergarten cop in an age. I just got a hankering for a kindergarten cop. I don't know what's going on with that. Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of lines from that one. William, have you seen Kindergarten Cop lately? Has anybody seen Kindergarten Cop lately? I feel like that's, uh, I don't know, I feel like I gotta put that in the rotation. That was a classic. Okay, my friends, um, aside from, uh, aside from movie, movie recommendations, um, I, I am going to be, I'm going to be starting this off tonight, and I'm going to be, uh, flying solo. Uh, you never seen Kindergarten Cop, William? I don't even know how to... I don't know how to talk to you, Joshua. How did, what? <laughs> did you see? Do you see that, Joshua? Mr. Kimball. <laughs> nah, it's not the tumor. I mean, you have to see it. I, I just. Oh man, it's probably been ten years since I've seen that movie. Jake does the best, Arnie. Uh, Who is your dad? <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> uh, see, I need Jake on Thursdays, man. Who is your daddy, and what does he do? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good movie, I think. And maybe it's one of those things where I'll go back and be like, that wasn't that good. But I'm pretty sure it's a great movie. Uh, all right, whatever. Uh, movie night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we have uh, we usually have Friday night family movie nights, but I, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it might be a little over the uh, the three and four year olds. Um, but but yeah. All right. Well, maybe Lisa and I'll <laughs> have a movie night. Uh, Lisa is with the uh, the children's. Uh, oh man, Turbo Man. There, there's there's a there's some Arnold classics, man. Jingle All the Way is totally underrated. Um, I'm not gonna tell you about Junior or Twins or anything else. No, but Kindergarten Cop, that's something special. Uh, all right, but that's not the point. The point is, um, Lisa is not going to be with us tonight. Sadly, apologize for that. Uh, but she is with the the Childrens, um, and so it's just gonna be uh, just gonna be Bible study time. We'll get into it in just a hot minute. Um, as far as announcements, as far as announcements, Jess, you do not have good taste in movies. Can we just say that? Or maybe you do have good taste, but you don't ever remember the names of movies. So I guess it, it's it's like it's pointless that you have good taste. <laughs> uh, but that's not what I want to talk about. Even though it clearly was what I wanted to talk about. Uh, no. What we are talking about is uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, with Michaela Mitchell, who is present, and I can see you there, um, leading us in worship at 10 o'clock, 10.30. Uh, 10.30, yeah, Pastor John, uh, on the road, uh, but isn't, isn't that what life has been all about uh, remotely? Um, John will be uh, taking us back into uh, the end of John's Gospel, toward the end of John's Gospel, and my friends, Holy Week is next week. Right, like this is this is this is good timing, man. Good timing in the spirit. Um, Easter's just right around the corner. We got all sorts of things happening, so so that's really good. Uh, how dare you, Zach? Gosh, it's so insulting uh, and possible. Um, now, aside from that, uh, Monday and Tuesday nights uh, continue on without without hesitation. Uh, so Monday at seven o'clock for the women's study. Tuesday at 7 o'clock for the men's study. Uh, please be there or be square. Be there or don't be saved. <laughs> oh, I'm just joking. Um, and uh, if you want to support the ministry at Zoe, we hugely appreciate it. Uh, it has been over a year of, uh, of, 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 of living, living this life. And uh, we're thankful for the Lord. We're thankful for those of you who have been supporting the ministry. And if you would like to be among those who support the ministry at this little church, uh, you can go to zoechurch.com and you could tithe or donate uh, gifts and offerings uh, there via the PayPal button, uh, which is just like an old sort of pixelated yellow donate button, classic looking button. Uh, or we could set you up with a Zelle or, um, or you can even do snail mail if you so choose. Um, hit me up and we can get you that, that information. Or tune in on Sunday mornings. John is usually um, good with that information off the top of his head. Um, aside from that, uh, we're jumping into Psalm 119, which is how we do. Uh, Psalm 119 tonight. Uh, I'm gonna pray. I'll do. I will. I will sing the doxology, and then we will get after it uh, for Psalm 119. So if you have Bibles, you can begin to. I'm talking to myself. I exhort myself. You can begin to turn to Psalm 119. 
Uh, and we are going to be uh, picking up in verse 121 tonight. Uh, what's up, Aaron? What's up, Liana? Uh, so let's say a prayer and let's get after it. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to be here connected to each other, to be here uh, just joining our hearts and, and our minds uh, in your presence, Lord, asking for the Holy Spirit to do the work that he continues to do uh, in our lives. And we pray that we would be open to that work, not just of learning, but of genuinely having our our hearts and our souls, our characters uh, be formed by the work of the Spirit and our time in the Word. We are called to be more like Christ, and there's only one way to, to do that, and that is to continue to pursue you in the ways you've called us to, to learn about you, to trust you. But ultimately, Lord, it's your Spirit. It's your Spirit that has to bring it from just a, an exercise or just some theological thoughts to the real flesh and blood of everyday life with Jesus. And so I pray that you would accomplish a little bit more in each one of our hearts tonight during our time in the Word. And I pray that there would be moments of real blessing for anyone who is able to, to hear these words and to, and to connect with them, that you would speak something uh, to each person, Lord, in a, in a personal way. Show us what to hold on to, how to let that seed go down deep into our hearts so that it will become part of who we are and not just another thing we heard. I thank you for all these things and I lift everything up in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, let's sing a little doxology, a little call to worship, and then we will worship by jumping into the Lord's scriptures. <sighs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay. Psalm 119, we are on the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The letter is Ion, and Psalm 119, verse 121. The psalmist writes, Don't leave me to the mercy of my enemies, for I have done what is just and right. Please guarantee a blessing for me. Don't let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes strain to see your rescue, to see the truth of your promise fulfilled. I am your servant. Deal with me in unfailing love and teach me your decrees. Give discernment to me, your servant. Then I will understand your laws. Lord, it is time for you to act. For these evil people have violated your instructions. Truly, I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. Each of your commandments is right. That is why I hate every false way. My friends, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, at this point of the year... Um, sort of heading into the heart of uh, sort of spring. And, and at this point of the year, just even since the, the pandemic, um, it's an interesting time, I've noticed, um, whether it's on campus uh, at a high school or it's in the wider world uh, around us. A lot of people, who, especially after this past year um, of challenges, have, uh, have gotten to a place where they are assessing the state of their relationships, and they're asking questions, and uh, and I I see you know in high school land I see, I see a lot of people breaking up, I see a lot of people breaking up, and uh, and I see a lot of people uh, a lot of people getting Twitter pated, a lot of people getting Twitter pated out there, but a lot of people in grown up land especially um, who have been through a year now of life under very different circumstances. Um, a lot of people are beginning to sort of pick their heads up, maybe getting excited about that vaccine, maybe getting excited about 
herd immunity, God willing, maybe getting excited about things kind of opening up and, and loosening up a little bit. And people are beginning to sort of take stock and assess the state of your relationship. Now, a lot of times we think about the state of like your romantic relationships, right? Or your spousal relationships. So, so maybe, maybe spouses are starting to ask themselves, okay, have we gotten closer this past year? Have we gotten more patient with each other this past year? Like to assess the state of your relationship. Like if you were to have that talk, <laughs> <laughs> which may be the last thing you want to do. Um, but I, do, I can feel it. I can feel that people are like, hmm, like how are th what are, what, what's going on here? How are things? <laughs> kind of looking around, feeling a little, maybe a tiny bit of breathing room and trying to ask these questions. Uh, and so, you know, if, you, if you're in a relationship or even just to say to your friendships, right, whatever your close relationships are, um, how's that going? How has, have you come through this last year? Let's say if you're, if you're married or, or if you're in the uh, kind of a dating relationship, have you, have you become more patient? Have you become kinder uh, during this year of, of challenges? Have, have you learned to sort of, uh, have you gotten closer in the Lord? Maybe is a good question. Um, have, you, have you begun to sort of pray together more? Uh, there was a, there's been a lot of challenging things. Ha, has that brought you closer together? Has it, has it pushed you further apart? Uh, asking questions about ass assessing the state of a relationship can be can be a little nerve wracking. Uh, it can be something that again, you know, it's a hard thing to do, um, but it's not a bad thing uh, to be self aware, to be aware of your relationship. We talked a little bit last week about having to kind of get down into the nitty gritty of our spiritual lives, and so it's actually a really good important thing if done correctly if done in a healthy way to assess sort of where you're at like where are you at as a marriage where are you at as a, a friend where are you at as maybe a son or a daughter or as a father or a mother like where are you at in your relationships if you were to take the temperature if you were to just say how have i come through the last year um am i am again you know easy questions am i more patient as a mom or as a dad Am I more this? Am I more that? Or, or is, it, is it not so good? Have I, have I kind of devolved or, or kind of tipped back into some bad habits? Have we argued more and not resolve and resolve things less? Um, you know, those kinds of questions uh, can be really good, can be really sort of eye-opening. Um, but it's really important at, at, at certain times in life to, to take stock. And so uh, I think that's, that's a reasonable thing for people to do. Uh, but not quite what I want to talk about tonight. Um, evangelicals are, are historically really good about talking about our faith as a relationship. And so people say, you know, I, it's not a religion. It's not a sort of ceremony. Um, but it is a relationship. It's a relationship that I have with the Lord. And by that, evangelicalism always meant sort of it's personal. It's personal. It's um, it's every day. It's um, it changes. It has its it has its challenging moments. But it's it's not a formula. It's not just a a set of exercises. But we have a relationship with the Lord, and and I think it's not a bad idea tonight to take the temperature on your relationship with the Lord, and but I want to do it in a certain way. I want to ask a question. Um, what kind of relationship with the Lord are we supposed to have? Again, I think when evangelicals usually use that language, I have a relationship with the Lord, or how's your relationship with the Lord, it usually means like it's really personal, it's, you know, me and Jesus, Jesus and I, you know, we're close, we're friends, you know, like we think of, we think of scriptures where Jesus says, man, I've called you friends, you know, I've called you my friends, um, or, or, we think of, or we think of metaphors and images about the church or the Christians being the, the bride of Christ, right? We think of us sort of uh, the, you know, marriage uh, kind of language in the scripture about God's relationship with his people, closeness, sort of, you know, that kind of intimacy of the soul that, that is unrivaled. Um, we think of that kind of relationship, I think, when we use the term relationship. But I would say that the dominant relationship that the scripture describes with the people of God and God is not the language necessarily of marriage, although that's a vital one. Um, and it's not the language of friendship, although that's an incredible one. Um, it's actually the language of a master and a servant. It's the language of a servant. 
Um, and I think that's worth thinking through a little bit more than maybe we do. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, we actually see the scripture by and large referring to God's relationship with his people as one of Lord to a servant. Lord, master, king to a servant. So if you think about not just the Old Testament where we are and we get the language of servant many, 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 many times. Israel will be described as the servant of the Lord. Uh, God will say, I brought you out of Egypt to establish you as a nation. You're my people. You're my, my vassal, right? Almost like the medieval kind of idea of a Lord and a vassal. I have saved you and protected you. And so now we are in this covenantal relationship in which there are certain obligations and there are certain expectations for myself as your Lord and yourselves as my servants, as my people. Um, but then also into the New Testament, and you know this if you know your scripture even a little bit, um, the New Testament is absolutely comfortable with the disciples, for example, describing themselves as the douloi, the, the bond slaves or the servants of God. It's one of Paul's most common phrases for himself. But the apostles will also describe Christians in the New Testament as servants of God. Uh, sometimes we'll describe them as saints. Other times describe them very clearly as servants. And this goes all the way through. Uh, the book of Acts, you'll see the Christians described as the servants of God. You'll see this in the book of Hebrews. Um, you know, if you're in the book of Acts, that word douloi or the word for slave or bond servant comes up several times. Acts 2.18, the birth of the church. Acts 4.29, when it talks about the church in its earliest moments. Um, later in Acts 16, 17, you see it again. But at many different points throughout, you'll hear the language of servant or servants or service as what actually defines our relationship most often with the Lord. If you think of uh, Paul in Romans talking about being a living sacrifice, what does he say? Because that's your reasonable service, right? Like the early Christians conceived of their relationship with the Lord as servants to a master, as, as servants. Jesus will even say, you know, if you're a servant, like, you don't complain. You don't, um, you know, you don't expect uh, sort of bonuses all the time or whatever. Like, you, you serve. That's what you do. Um, and, and then he'll teach them what it means to serve and to love. And he'll say, like, as he washes the disciples' feet, serve one another, right? If you want to be a leader, be a servant, right? Um, when Titus, or in the pastoral epistles, when they're talking about elders in the church, those who oversee or look out for people, uh, one of the words that is used often there is a steward or a household sort of servant manager who looks out for things that are not theirs, uh, but stewards the land of another, stewards the possessions or the resources of a lord, right? Again, I mean, I teach middle, medieval history, so it's, it's, it's all that same language of a lord and a vassal or a nobleman and a serf, right? Like it's the language of uh, I have given you life. I have given you a place, a form of life, a, a, a way to live. I have sustained you with your daily bread, but you are my servants, right? Jesus telling parables about servants who are tending, um, you know, a, a, a plot of land or a vineyard while the master was away. I mean, that language of the servant-master relationship is, I would say, the dominant language all the way to the book of Revelation about the relationship of God and his people. So when we're asked the question about the state of our relationship with the Lord, we want to sort of define a little bit more precisely maybe what we mean by our relationship with the Lord. And so when we ask that question, one of the places we should start and we don't start very often is the language of, well, first, last, always, we are servants of the Lord. Uh, we are not first, last, always, you know, buddies of the Lord. Uh, although the Lord uses the language of friendship and it's incredible. Um, but we are first, last, and always servants, you know, that, that well done, good and faithful servant, right? That your life is to be a, in service to Christ, that you are to serve one another as Christ has served you, right? That that is actually the language when we ask ourselves, how is our relationship with the Lord? We should say, how are we doing as servants of the Lord? 
Um, and so in this psalm, in this section of Psalm 119, we have on three different occasions the language of the psalmist saying, I am your servant, I am your servant, I am your servant. It predominates this section. And so it really is the kind of framework that we want to think about when we're looking at these scriptures. And when we even get started in the very first verse of this section in verse 121, you can see, even though the word servant isn't there yet, it's going to come up three different places shortly hereafter, uh, but even though the word servant isn't there yet, if you look at the language of this verse, um, don't leave me to the mercy of my enemies for what I have done, or for I have done what is just and right. The psalmist is already in this context of a, of a life that has challenges, or he's always in that context, life with its challenges, uh, enemies, people who are oppressing or attacking or pushing back on um, or tempting or trying to um, take or th you know rob him of his life in the Lord or mock him or right there 's always antagonism going on because he lives in the real world, but he is saying his appeal opens with uh, an appeal for protection, an appeal to his Lord for protection that 's the language of a servant appealing to their Lord. Right? That's the language of a vassal appealing to their Lord for protection. That relationship fundamentally between a Lord and a vassal is one in which the Lord promises protection. And the vassal then sort of you know, works the land or produces you know, and gives uh, uh, you know, a tax or a tithe of, of what they uh, do with their, their, their land that they were given. Um, but the land is the Lord's. The protection is from the Lord. Everything about that relationship has obligations and expectations. The psalmist opens by pleading for protection from his Lord. He is a servant pleading for protection. And he's saying, um, I have done what is just and right. I have done what is just and right. In other words, there are things about the life of a servant that the Lord expects to be done. And those things that the Lord, our Lord, expects to be done is to live and to treat others in a way that is just and right. That there is a form of life that the Lord expects us to live. We've seen this time and time again, so much so that at the end of this psalm, as you heard me say, um, he'll say, that is why I hate every false way. Well, the true way, the true path, is the one that the servant is being obedient to his Lord. He is living in such a way that the Lord has called him to live, that he is considering his life not his own, but he is considering his life the life of his lords. He is a servant. And so he is saying, I need the protection of my Lord in the circumstances that I'm facing right now with the dramas and the challenges of life. I need the protection of the Lord, and I have been the Lord's servant. I have been living in a way that is just and right. And he's not saying, I, I earned 50 obedience points, now you owe me 50 you know, blessing points or something like that. He's saying, I am in this relationship. I understand that I am a servant. I understand that if I'm really to be the servant I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to live a certain way. It's not just doing what you would do maybe in a feudal economy where, I, where you just pay a tax or you just pay the tithe and that sort of covers you with God, right? Like, it's not, you're not paying off the system, right? He's like, no. I have lived in such a way that is righteous. I have lived and am pursuing life in the way that is, in the eyes of my Lord, just and right and good and expected of me. So what he's saying is like, I am living my life in the terms of this relationship. It is not lip service. It's not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the Lord a tax or a tithe and, and then he's going to go away and I'm going to actually live however I want, which is how a lot of people approach their relationship with the Lord but that's not how a servant approaches their relationship with the Lord. So he's saying, I'm approaching my relationship with the Lord as a servant. I am, I am seeking to do what is just and right in the way the Lord has called me to. So that's where he starts his appeal. Is he's saying, I'm in this relationship. This relationship is defined a certain way, and it is, you are my Lord. I am your servant. I need you, but I also know that my relationship with you is based in part on my obedience and my fulfilling the obligations of how to live the just and the righteous life. So he starts from that place, right? He frames his life in those terms, right? And so maybe the first question, if we were to assess 
the state of our relationship with Jesus is. Are we living as servants of the Lord? Are we living in a way that is getting more just, that is getting more righteous? If you were to just look back at the terms of since last March, since last March, this, this, this year, this year from March to March, um, have you gotten better at being just? Have you gotten better at treating people fairly? Have you gotten better at obeying Jesus? If, if we were to ask that question, are you living more and more in the relationship of a servant to your Lord? Are you living in a way that you could say is growing or maturing in righteousness? Is there fruit? I mean, that, that is always the challenging thing is you can actually ask that question. From this last year, from March to March, do you see fruit in your life of a righteous life? Do you see fruit of treating people justly? Do, do you see fruit of selflessness? Do you see fruit of a life that has been given to be a life in service to the Lord and to his people? Um, do you see that? Um, and so that's a good question to ask as we start to assess our relationship with the Lord. Have we been growing as servants? Have we been growing in living a righteous life? And if it's a hard question or it throws you off a little bit, again, the reason people have a state of the relationship discussion or reflection is because you realize how important it is because we don't have that many relationships in our lives that are like, really, you know, sort of formative and shaping. And our relationship with the Lord is meant to be the most formative and shaping. So if you're ever going to ask tough questions, if you're ever going to do that, I mean, you know, spouses should do that and have good, robust, honest conversations. Friends should do that. Uh, you know, family members should do that. But you got to do that if you're talking about your relationship with the Lord. If it's supposed to be the most formative, the most decisive, the most central, then you should be able to ask the question, from last March to this March, have I grown in living a just, a righteous life? Have I grown in my obedience to Christ? He starts in the terms of that relationship of a servant to his Lord, of a servant in need of his Lord's protection. But when he moves to verse 122, when he moves to verse 122, he asks the Lord then, please, please, NLT is a little misleading here, so I'm going I'm to try to slow and unpack this a little bit more. But he says in, the one, in verse 122 in the NLT, it says, Please guarantee a blessing for me. Don't let the arrogant oppress me. So he, he's still thinking about the challenges of life. He's still thinking about all the things that are pushing and pulling on his thought life especially, but maybe even his own bodily safety. Um, and he says, Please, Lord. Like the terms are servant and Lord. Please, Lord, guarantee a blessing for me. Now, the reason... That's not a great translation. First of all, it's just sort of misleading. A blessing sounds like, I don't know, a token, a, a trinket, um, some like stack of cash or a promotion at work or something like that. That's not what this is. This is not like a token of something fun or enjoyable or something like that. The language that's underneath this this verse, the Hebrew language that's underneath this verse, is more about asking the Lord. In fact... He's not saying, please do this thing for me. What he says is, please be a guarantor of your servant, uh, a, guarantor, a guarantor for your servant of what is good. So it's a little more of a complex phrase, even if we were to sort of retranslate it. He's asking the Lord to be a guarantor or a surety um, of the good in his life. It's much more robust than guarantee a blessing for me, which sounds like it could be defined by you. Um, instead, he's asking the Lord to be his guarantor. And so it, it's really the language about the Lord, who the Lord is for the servant, for the psalmist, rather than what the Lord can do for the servant, for the psalmist. Do you see the difference there? He's saying, be a guarantor uh, for your servant for the good. Okay. So what he's talking about is terms of, of something like a surety or a pledge. In other words, and you see this in various different scriptures, but the word that's rendered here in, in, in the Hebrew is stand as a surety, stand as a guarantee of what? 
Yeah, well, a surety or a pledge is almost always used when someone takes responsibility for someone else. When someone takes responsibility for someone's debt. So like if I, if I owed someone $1,000 or something and I was pleading with, I don't know, my father or somebody, please be the guarantor of my debt. Um, I would be saying, can you please take on the responsibility of my debt? Um, can you be the surety? Can you be the backer? Can you be the person that will be turned to? Um, if I can't pay this back, that you would be able to say, don't worry, I, I co-sign. I'm the guarantor of this pledge, of this thing, right? So it's, the, it's actually the language about, please, Lord, take responsibility, not, not just for my life. He says, more specifically, take responsibility. Be the guarantor of good in my life. Okay, and even that, even saying good or the good in my life is much more robust than saying, please give me a blessing. <laughs> like that's very misleading in our context with what we usually mean by those things, right? Give me a blessing, give me something, give me some bonus, give me something. It sounds really shallow, sort of fickle, tends to be sort of, again, defined by us. But if you were to ask this question about what the good is in your life, um, the good is is whatever the Lord uh, has brought into your life. What is good is what is the Lord has brought into your life. That might not even always feel like a blessing. It might feel like a great challenge, right? Even in our relationships, spousal relationships, relationships with our kids, relationships with friends or family, um, those people may be in your life as the Lord's good, like as what you very much need and as what very much is a blessing to you. But they may also be what you think is a source of a lot of your woes, right? Like you might be like, ah, oh, if only these kids would sleep, then I could sleep. And if, oh man, can you imagine if the house was quiet and we could just read our Bibles all day? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you dream of, but obviously that's a little personal there. Um, but you know, like instead of saying, Lord, please give me a blessing, I'm in a bad place. It, that's almost like, Lord, you know, buy me something. I'm sad, right? Like that's the worst. Worst dad ever, okay? Um, and, and so he's not, asking, he's not saying that. He said, Lord, can you be responsible? Can, be the, you, can you be the guarantor? Can you be the surety? The, the, the presence of? Can you be? Not can you give me that, but can you be the guarantor of the good in my life? Now think about that. So he's saying, he's, it's almost like he's reminding himself, okay, the Lord is in my life. My life has got a lot of challenges, right? He keeps talking about people attacking him and being oppressed and being like, you know, I mean, enemies at the gates. And yet he's like, Lord, be the guarantor of the good in my life. And in some sense, I think it's the servant saying, man, if you're a servant and your life is challenging, you're a servant. Like Jesus says, like, you know, those who are servants in the kingdom of God are not supposed to grumble or complain, or, or tap their foot and say, I don't know, we'll see how this servant thing works out. You know, it's like, if you're a servant, you're not interviewing your Lord, <laughs> you know? You're not, like, he's not on trial to see if you want to continue to be a servant in his household or at his manorial estate, right? If you're a servant, that's what you are. It's, it's, not, it's not about you, know, you testing whether or not you get what you want. And so he's saying, can you, like, Lord, you yourself, your presence in my life, may that be the guarantor, may that be the guarantee. The, can you take responsibility for my good? Okay, now that is very different. Lord, take responsibility for my good. In other words, even if I am seeing only challenges right now, be the guarantor of the good in my life. In other words, be the presence. Show me those things. Show me what is the good that you have brought into my life, even if it seems like it's, it's hard to see sometimes, or even if it seems like I'm distracted by enemies and people who are attacking and the challenges or the failures or whatever the things are. Lord, can you be the guarantor? Can you take responsibility, not only for my debt, See, I think we get, as Christians, we're like, yeah, Jesus took responsibility for my debt of sin on the cross, and he saved me, and that's why he's my Lord, and that's why I really am sort of understanding how powerful that is. I had a debt I couldn't pay. He paid the debt I couldn't pay. He was the guarantor for my debt. 
But sometimes we don't make the move into the life of a Christian and say, he's not just a guarantor for the debt of my sin. He's the guarantor of the good. He's, he's, he takes responsibility, not just to forgive me or wash me clean from my sin, which is life-changing, soul-transforming, but he also takes responsibility for your good, for, for, for the good in your life. That's also what he brings to you by his presence in that relationship. He is your Lord. He, he is your protector. He, he is your master. As we'll see, he is your teacher. He, he is many things. But the psalmist uh, is sort of proclaiming, um, acknowledging, um, like almost exhorting kind of the reality in before him. He is also the guarantor, the responsibility taker of your good. Now, what that means is, if you are in this relationship with your Lord, if you are living in a way as a servant of the Lord, he is taking responsibility and will continue to take responsibility to bring the good into your life. Now, again, the good may not be what you thought it would, should be. The good may not be what you're focused on right now. It may not be uh, the job thing or, or even the human relationship thing. The good is whatever your Lord knows is the good for you. And so even if it seems like you're in a place where you don't see a lot of good things, the psalmist would encourage us, well, if he's your Lord and we know his character, he's taken responsibility to forgive you of the debt you couldn't pay, he's died for your sins, how much more... Does he long to, and how much more is he actually, right now, by his presence in your life, bringing the good? Bringing the good to your life. Now, if you saw that as a servant, you do not just have a Lord who will protect you or rescue you from danger or, or a Lord who will give you a place to live and some land to work and things like that, but if you realize that it wasn't just, and then good luck, but that the intimacy of the Lord and servant relationship here with Jesus in our context is one in which you can know that you can trust him to bring the good that he has for you into your life. And what that means is you are freed from chasing after the good. In other words, you are freed from trying to bring good things into your life constantly, which most people are trying to do. What is the goal of all life? It's the, what? <laughs> it's the Declaration of Independence, right? Uh, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Pursuit of things that we think are good, right? And we, and, we, and we strive and we try to find relationships and we try to find meaningful work and we, and we try and we strive and we try and we strive. But what the psalmist is saying is, man, the Lord be that. The Lord be, the, like to be. He is that. He is the guarantor. He is the one who's taking responsibility for the good in my life. So I don't have to try to make my life good by whatever, fantasizing about a perfect this or the perfect that or buying the perfect this or meeting the perfect that. I can trust that if I'm in this relationship with the Lord and I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord, his presence in my life will bring the good. That he's respons He's taken responsibility for bringing good things into my life. And so you're not on your own trying to figure out how to do that, which is what most people spend their entire lives doing. It's also what takes a lot of people away from the Lord because they think good things are a certain thing and he's not bringing those things in. So instead of trusting that the Lord is bringing what's good to us, we say, yeah, Lord, you're not bringing enough of it. So I'm going to actually kind of separate a little bit from you in our relationship so that I can go pursue certain things that I think are good. So th this is really a profound thing. If you realize in your relationship with the Lord that he has become, that he is the guarantor, that he has taken responsibility, that if you are in this relationship, that you are his servant, he is your Lord, he will 
be and he will bring the good to your life. And that that's his responsibility because he's your Lord. He, he's not your occasional boss. You know, he, he is your Lord. And that is one of the responsibilities he has taken upon himself, not only to, to take care of our debts, but to bring us life, to bring us abundant life in the spirit, even if we're facing extraordinary challenges. So if we had a second question about the state of our relationship with the Lord, we could say, are we trusting the Lord? Have we trusted the Lord from March to March, this last year from March to March? Have we trusted that the Lord is the one who will bring the good? That the Lord is the one who brings good things? And that if we stick with him and we stay with him and we serve him, he as our Lord will bring the good things into our life that we that are truly good even if we have to learn how to see them uh, that's a good question and, and and a good motivation to say man st we can stop striving and trying to figure out how to make ourselves happy the psalmist says the Lord has taken that responsibility so that he is going to bring and be what's good in our lives and as servants we can trust that that's one of the things he has taken upon himself to be for us. Like, that's awesome. And, and that's the thing. When you're in a servant-master relationship with the Lord, and you're not in like a friend-buddy-buddy -buddy relationship with the Lord, or, or even sometimes in our minds a spousal kind of relationship, like when you're not equals with the Lord and you realize he's the Lord and you're the not Lord, right? Like it can be incredibly freeing and rest inducing to be like oh man he's my lord he he's promised to be things in my life that i've always needed protection i've always needed protection i've always needed i've always needed good things i've always needed things in my life that are truly good and he's promised to bring that into my life but it's this it's this incredible idea about taking responsibility for our good i was reading a story in the la times um and it was a really, it was a sad but also like encouraging story. Um, and it was about a Chinese family who lives in Ladera Ranch, um, which is our neighborhoods, right? Like right, right there. Um, some of our people live there or live there. Um, and it was about this Chinese family who moved to Ladera Ranch, I think it was in September. And almost within weeks of moving into Ladera Ranch, if you don't know, Ladera Ranch is like this pristine this beautiful sort of like trees and grass and parks and 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 young families everywhere and you know people barbecuing and you know everybody jogging and stuff like that like it's a really beautiful community right um and this chinese family moved there in september and within weeks started to experience harassment now harassment from neighborhood kids uh like teenage age neighborhood kids and um and and it was actually pretty bad. Like, um, you know, at first it'd be like harassment, like, um, you know, people would like, they'd be ringing the doorbell at like, you know, whatever. Uh, as soon as they sat down for dinner, they'd be ringing, ringing the doorbell or whatever. And, uh, you know, kids would be kids. Okay, so maybe they're just ding dong ditch, you know. Like, I don't know, who among us hasn't done that? Um, but then, but then it was obvious that it had a, a different flavor to it. And, um, and the wife uh, had a couple experiences back in the fall in September and October uh, in which these sort of kids in this area or the neighborhood um, were started shouting ethnic slurs at her. And, you know, if you, if you don't know, if you haven't been I don't know if you, have, if, you have, if you haven't been awake or alive for the last two weeks, especially, um, you know, finally a lot of uh, language and, and focus and attention has been sort of um, around the fact that there's been a huge increase uh, over the last four years in particular, but last year especially, um, in anti-Asian American um, treatment, right? Um, cases of just sort of like low-key but really disturbing sort of acts of sort of physical sort of, uh, you know, violence and, and tons of acts of harassment and shouting at, at um, Asian Americans, uh, you know, things about the coronavirus and blaming them for, because it, you know, started in Wuhan, China or whatever. So this family, the C family, who, who moved to Ladera, immediately started experiencing like this harassment. And it was like, what the heck? Like, this, this is supposed to be like, you know, this wonderful little corner of the world in which everything's perfect, 
or whatever. And um, and and I would imagine because they were new and uh, they had moved to the states from China in 2016, and uh, and and they were just like kind of shaken by this. And they have an eight year old and a five year old, and like there would be like uh, rocks and things thrown at the house. There would be you know doorbells being rung, things being shouted in the middle of the night, waking up their eight year old and their five year old, like scaring their children. Look. People can put up with a lot of things. If you're scaring my kids, like, you can bet I'm not going to be like, well, <laughs> kids will be kids, right? Like, it started to get nasty, and it started to stay consistent. And so, like, the guy, you know, he's a dad. He's like, what, what is this? What's going on here? So he has to, like, start, like, keeping watch, like, at night, like, you know, out the window. He installs, like, you know, security cameras to, like, see what's going on because it, it goes on for weeks and weeks and then months. It goes on for months. And, and he, so, and he, like, seven different times the police were called. And, and it was just, like, this crazy thing. And even when he told his neighbors at first, or there was a couple neighbors that he knew, and he started mentioning it, like, hey, like, I don't know what to do. Like, this thing is happening, and my family's, like, being harassed. And it's, like, it's really, like, it's really awful. Like, was, we just moved here. Like, we're supposed to, this is our community. Like, we don't even feel comfortable here because we're just being, like, harassed regularly by, like, these, like, kids, you know, in the area or whatever, whatever it is. And at first, like, the neighbors who, like, heard about this, they were thinking, oh, it's probably not that big of a deal. You know, maybe they're just, you know, making a lot out of this and whatever. And then they started to realize, like, it was going on for months and seven different times the police were called. And it was just, like, really crazy. And so finally, the neighbors stepped up and they're like, and they literally said, you know, an article, we're like, we need to take responsibility for our neighbor. Like, it can't be, you know, like this guy works a job, his wife's like, you know, like these people are, or these are people, they can't just be waiting up all hours of the night. He was like, yeah, we weren't getting any sleep, we're getting like three or four hours of sleep because they'd like ring the doorbell at two in the morning or they'd throw rocks at the house or they'd shout ethnic slurs in the middle of the night. And he's like, we weren't like sleeping and I, he's got to go to work, all this kind of stuff. Finally, the neighbors heard about it enough, like area, the people in the area, and they were like, this is ridiculous. And so they like, like formed up. And they were like, we're going to help you keep watch. We're going to take responsibility for the fact that you're our neighbor and you should be treated with decency and respect just as we would expect to be treated. And so instead of being like, ah, it's no big deal or whatever, months of harassing this family, finally neighbors started to um, sort of like keep watch, almost like a little neighborhood watch around this family's house. And no joke, even those who were keeping watch had moments in which these groups of kids on bikes would come by and from like a hill nearby would throw rocks at the neighbors and the family in their front yard like in the evening who were like keeping watch just for that reason. Like it was like really aggressive. Um, and the fact that it made it like, you know, into an article in the, in, the, in the Times, you don't normally hear South County, you know, with whatever. Um, but man, it was, uh, it was a really sad, but also, you know, a somewhat encouraging story of people taking responsibility for someone else's good. And, you know, we're so used to as Americans, like take responsibility for your own good, you know, like buy a German shepherd, you know, like figure it out, right? Like we're just kind of always like, you know, figure out, you figure out whatever. But it's like, man, I don't know how you felt this last year, but I felt like I know I'm supposed to be more of a neighbor. I felt like, man, I know I'm supposed to be like more of a, a, a caretaker and a more connected to the people I live around. And, uh, and I, so I also found it like encouraging that these neighbors around this Chinese family was like, we're going to take responsibility like, uh, you know, for, for your safety and for, and for you being able to get sleep and for the good in your life. And I just thought, man, that's, that's a thing, man. And, and, you know, I don't know, I don't know, but it, it, in this way, like it's a, it's a small picture of, of, of when you, when life gets to a certain point, I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how successful you are. Like everyone this last year from March to March, every single human being alive has run into things that you can't fix. You can't fix it on your own. You can't fix it on your own. Every single one of us has come up against things since last March to this March. And we're just like, you know, I'm usually really whatever. I'm usually really resilient. I'm usually really strong in this area. I'm usually really focused. I'm usually really good at devotional time. I'm usually really good at this. I'm usually really good at praying as a family. I'm usually really good. And then you hit things and you hit things and you hit 27 things and you hit months of something 
And you're like, I can't fix this. I can't fix this. I can't fix this. I can't fix that. I can't fix a lot of this. <laughs> and, and I think in that sense, what a blessing. What a blessing to be reminded or to discover for the first time that the Lord seeks to take responsibility for our good. That he seeks to bring into our life the things we really need and that we get kind of used to bringing the things we want into our life. But hopefully, one of the good things about this last year is that you've realized you can't bring the good into your life by yourself, on your own. That, that you need others, that you need the Lord to bring the good into your life. That you need the Lord to be your protection. That you need the Lord to forgive you of your sins, to pay that debt you couldn't pay. And that you need the Lord for the good to be in your life at all. That you need the Lord. That you can't fix that problem. That you can't scratch that itch. That you you keep buying more things or or you keep going down more sort of dangerous habit rabbit holes or or you keep kind of, you know, doing whatever you got to do, but you can't fix that problem. What a blessing to realize that the Lord has claimed responsibility to bring the good to your family, to your children, to your spouse, to yourself. To, I mean, like, to me, that is one of like, the greatest things a person could hear. You know, uh, to be a servant means this is the kind of Lord we have. Lord, be the guarantor of the good in my life. I find that so... Verse 123, the servant waits, the servant waits for deliverance. He says, my eyes strain to see your rescue. We get this sense, right, that, that this, this person, this psalmist, is in the midst of challenges that are not just going away, that he's in the midst of a lot of real life, as we all are. And, and yet, he doesn't say, my eyes strain to see your rescue, I don't see it, and I'm over it. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say, and so time's up. You know, he doesn't say, and so, like, impatience is not in this, this, this verse. It's honest, right? Man, I'm waiting, Lord, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on that promise. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on that rescue. The enemies are getting closer, Lord. They're coming over the hills. Lord, where are you? Like, I, I'm waiting for that rescue, waiting. But he's not grumbling. He's not complaining, and he's not turning away. A lot of times, and we've talked about this in Psalm 119, but a lot of times when we don't get the fix, when it doesn't turn around, man, we turn away to other things. We're going to start whatever. We're going to start drinking, smoking. We're going to do something. We're going to look at pornography. We're going to do something to just say, you know what? I don't see anything changing. We're going to start dating people that we shouldn't date. We're going to start, you know, whatever it is. We're just... <laughs> We're going to turn really slothful. You know, I don't know what your go-to not good is. Um, but man, when you're waiting on the Lord and you run out of ability or patience with the Lord, man, it turns to other things. Self-pity and self-pity turns to whatever your vice of choice happens to be. It, it turns to turning away from the Lord. That's not what the psalmist is doing. And I think this is really important. If we really understand that our primary relationship with the Lord is defined best by being a servant, uh, that should make all of us more patient. It's like if you're an equal partner in a business or something like that, you know, you might be like, hey, hey, come on, come on, <laughs> like, come on. But if you're a servant to a Lord, like, it would be like inconceivable. It would be inconceivable for a true servant to complain. Like, that would not be a thinkable thought in the ancient world. Jesus says as much. He's like, can you imagine, like, a servant being like, how come, how come you didn't um, smile when I looked at you? <laughs> but a lot of times we're like, oh, well, our relationship with Jesus is sort of like a boyfriend. It's sort of like a spouse. It's sort of like, right? Like, we kind of are sort of like a buddy. It's sort of like a therapist. It's sort of like, mm. um, you know. Like, he just sort of, you know, he pets me when I'm sad. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But, like, if we actually understood that our relationship was as a servant, um, like, what, where would a servant have space for complaint? Or where would a servant even feel the presumption to be, like, tapping their foot at their Lord? <laughs> like, that would, that would not be a thing. 
and 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 Jesus makes that reference pretty explicit um, when he talks about like you're expected to stay the course. You're expected to grow in resilience. You're expected to be patient. And and as a servant, that is like descriptive. It's just like that's what a servant is. A servant waits on their Lord. And a servant's timeline is not the same thing as the Lord's timeline. And a servant doesn't demand their Lord have their timeline. In fact, the whole life of the servant is having their Lord's timeline. So I love that you could strain wait, hope, plead, um, but not grumble, not turn away, not uh, roll your eyes or just, you know what, you know what, it's just, I've, I've walked with the Lord for so many years and I never found my spouse or I walked with the Lord for so many years and I just have continual financial ruin and I, you know what, you know what, you know what, <laughs> like that's not the language of a servant. I know that's the language of fallen human beings like us but it is not the language of a servant. So a servant can be patient because a servant's life is on the Lord's timeline, not the other way around. And you kind of see this when he refers uh, to the Lord having unfailing love. And we're going to get there in, in, in just a second. Um, he says in verse 124, I am your servant. He's almost like, I got to remind myself. I am your servant. Deal with me in unfailing love love unfailing i mean that that's one way of saying resilient patient love in, in that sense right the servant realizes that they're definitely hoping their lord is patient with them and so it should be silly for them not to be patient with their lord right the relationship is not equals right um it's god and his servant Right? It's a Lord, it's a master, and, there's, and his servant. Um, and so he's saying, I, I am your servant. Like, it just makes it really clear. Deal with your servant according to your unfailing love. In other words, almost as soon as he kind of thinks, oh, Lord, I'm waiting, I'm waiting on your word, I'm waiting on you, on your rescue from these enemies. And then he's like, I'm waiting on you? Yeah, it's all, I don't know, like, I can hear, you can hear his thought process. And he says, I just, I'm... I'm really happy and, and hoping that you continue to be patient with me. And it, it isn't, that, isn't that the truth? If we, if we were to ask the first question, if you were assessing the state of your relationship with the Lord, and you were to say, are you learning to be more resilient as a servant of the Lord? Are you learning for your timeline to be the Lord's timeline and, and not to grow weary or pa impatient with the Lord? Uh, from this last March to this March, this last year, if you were to assess your patience in the Lord as a servant of the Lord, have you, have you found the place where you realize as a servant you can be completely patient with the Lord because it's actually the Lord's timeline that is the one that matters, right? Um, that's a good question. It's not an easy question. Um, but then that, that next one is, is just the affirmation. The Lord deals with us with unfailing love. The Lord knows all our failures, knows our impatience, knows our grumbling, our complaining, knows the secrets in our heart, knows the secret life we would pursue sometimes, know, knows how divided our loyalties can get. Right? The Lord knows everything about us, every failure, all the things. Um, and he continues to love us continues to be patient as he teaches us, as he works things into your life, as he tries to show you and form in you what's good. How patient has the Lord had to be with you? How patient has the Lord had to be with me? I mean, that, that is, is something that as you reflect on that, man, it really does shift how your heart is when you think about, am I growing in patience? Well, I would say if you're growing in understanding your relationship with the Lord as one of a servant to a master, that will help you grow in patience because that's a better description of that reality than a lot of other things are. Um, and, and then you start thinking about who your Lord is and you start thinking about how unfailingly loving and gracious and patient he is with you. And that that changes something that shifts that softens something in the human heart that realizes that so that we can let go of our anxious sort of timeline or our series our list of our to-do list that we want the lord 
Hey, you're the Lord, so you're supposed to. Aren't you supposed to be responsible for all the good things? Where are all the good things? You know, like, where is it? I still see enemies. Like, where? Why aren't they gone? Right? Um, and it and it doesn't mean you get passive. It doesn't mean you get less honest. It doesn't mean you hide. Um, you know your desperation or your hurts or you know the the immediacy of certain moments um it just means that you recognize how patient the lord is how he's in control and he's sovereign and and you're a servant you're a servant you are not the master and and so then when he says give discernment to me your servant verse 125 then i will understand your laws these things are all connected in the heart you can feel this as a, it's partially illogical, but it's more of an, an affective or an affection sort of uh, progression here. Um, Lord, I'm waiting for that rescue, but you've been waiting on me. You've been, you, you loved me when I, when I was uh, uh, rebelling and turning away from when I didn't even know you or believe in you or care about you. Oh, Lord, I am your servant. You have been unfeeling love. And then, and then he's like, and then he asks, Give me discernment. Like, help me to see better, right? Help me to see better the good. Help me to see better your work. Help me to see better your activity. Help me to see better this situation. Like we said last week, that help me to see the actual stuff in my spiritual life. Help me to see better um, what the Lord is actually calling me, saying to me, trying to do. As a sheep listening for the shepherd's voice, Tune my ear to hear. Help me to discern the difference between the voice of the Lord and the voice of my own heart. What a fundamental distinction. He says, give discernment to me, your servant. I want to live well as your servant, but I'm going to need to be able to discern, to be able to rightly divide, to be able to tell the difference between different impulses, voices, hopes, expectations, demands, whatever. Then he says, if you give me discernment, then I will understand your laws. Then I'll, I'll really start to put the pieces together. I'll start to really get it. Not just know I'm supposed to obey it, but really see the good in the Lord's laws, in the Lord's commands, in the commands of Christ. I was having a conversation with a young man today and we were talking about what Jesus expects of men of any age uh, when it comes to things like lust. And I was talking about, you know, Jesus says, you know, if you, if you lust in your heart, you are committing adultery in your heart. That it's like, it's really serious, but we don't necessarily treat it seriously enough or we don't talk about it in that way. And, uh, and, and we were talking about like, and I was like, you know, if we really understood, like if we understood what sin is, what it does, what the temptations are. If we understood like that every woman in this context, that every woman is a daughter of the Lord's, uh, you know, that they bear the image of the living God, that they are the king's daughter, that, that they, are, they are worthy of respect and honor um, of, of what the psalmist would say is righteous, just treatment. Um, lust wouldn't be so tempting. It's like you. It's like you have to understand. You can you can hear a command and you can just try to try to do the command, um, but you have to you have to have discernment. You have to be able to discern your own heart. You have to be able to discern how the world operates in some in some basic ways. But you have to have understanding of like why and what is really here when the Lord says this. It's not just no, 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 no. What, what he's doing is, is he's, he's bringing life by forbidding the destruction of the image of God or forbidding the destruction of life in others. He's bringing life to you by saying, whatever you do, make sure you don't do that. It, but you have to have understanding. That's what I was talking to, to this uh, young man about. You have to have understanding of what, why, of the good, of the, of the reason. Now, you don't have to understand everything to obey. You can know, hey, Jesus said this, even if I don't get it yet, I can follow through because he's my Lord. And a servant doesn't be like, well, if you can really persuade me, <laughs> you know, then I'll obey. That's not a servant. A servant's going to be like, yes, Lord, whatever you say, Lord. But then the servant is pleading in verse 125, 
for discernment. He wants to grow. He doesn't just want to obey because he must. Of course he must. He's not saying anything against that. He's saying, I want to understand, though. I want to know. I want to really grow in my relationship with you as my Lord. I want to know, why does the word say this? And why does the word say this is good and this is not? And why does the word say this is health and this is life and this is not health? This is toxic. This is death. Why? Like, I want to, I'll, I'll obey long before I understand because that is my, my, my role as a servant to trust the Lord and obey my Lord. But I want to grow and I want to discern and I want to understand his laws. I want to understand the words of Jesus carefully, which is what we're trying to do on Sunday morning. I can't encourage you enough to tune in on Sunday morning at 1030, YouTube channel, Zoe Church San Juan. Uh, John's been carefully going through um, the life and now the last uh, day's life, week um, and now the resurrection um, of Jesus, and in part so that we don't just know, okay, I'm supposed to do this, or I'm supposed to believe this, or I'm supposed to think this, or I'm supposed to whatever, know this, but that I can understand what he's saying. I want to understand it. Like, a servant doesn't have to understand to obey, but a servant of this kind of Lord, one who approaches us with unfailing love, the Lord wants you to discern. He wants you to understand. He wants you to be able to see and divide the difference between your impulse, your heart, and what he's actually said. And then, and then be able to see not just uh, something that's being forbidden, but something that is actually preserving the good, um, revering, upholding life, because it is refusing the destruction of that life. Um, so he's like, man, I just feel that really strongly. Um, are you growing? Are you growing? in your discernment of the Lord and his word? Are you growing in discernment from last March to this March? Would you say that you've grown in your ability to discern the voice of the Lord and to discern and understand better his word? It's a really good question. If we're assessing the state of our relationships as servants of the Lord Jesus, are we growing in discernment? Have we been growing in discernment in our ability to understand the Lord and his word? It's a good question. And then in verse 126, he says, Lord, it's time for you to act. These evil people have violated your instructions. Like, they, they've broken the door down. You know, one of the things that's, that struck me in the in the article about this this family in Ladera um, was like, you know, I mean, it was like talking, the, it was the dad that was talking. And it was like, at one point he goes, I'm just asking parents to tell your kids to stop. Like, like this is our neighborhood too. Like, it was like, I don't know, it was like a point had, had been reached, and this is a father with young kids. I can't, I, you know, father with young kids, and his family's being harassed. Ethnic slurs being shouted at them, rocks being thrown at their house, doorbells being rung at two in the morning to, to intentionally just mess, scare the kids, disrupt the sleep, whatever. And he didn't say a lot in the article. He was just, I'm just asking for parents to tell your kids to stop. Like, can you guys just stop? Is that okay? Can you just stop? We want to live here too. And, and the neighbors who finally like heard, realized what was going on, like responded to like, you help like, you know, like take responsibility for their neighbor. They were like, once we realized this wasn't just some like, oh, you know, kids goof off. Um, once we realized like this was like months long harassment, we were just like, this has to stop. This is crazy. This is our neighborhood. Like we, this is not, this is not the neighborhood we want. Like th this, ha something has to change. This is, this is crazy. And it was just a real simplicity. It wasn't dramatic uh, when the dad talked. It was like really clear. It was really simple. He wasn't like, why is this happening? He was just like, I'm just asking parents if you could tell your children to stop. Like, it would be awesome. That would be great. Thank you. Like, it was super straightforward. And I, and I, and you know, it's because as a person, as a, as a man, as a father, as a husband, he's like, this can't keep happening. Like, we, like, and I don't want to move. Like, this is, this is just wrong. It's wrong. It needs to stop. That happens. And, and, and the psalmist is at a very similar place. Uh, verse 126, Lord, it's time. This guy's like, these, these evil people, man, like, this has got to stop. This is, this is, 
they, they've broken your law. Like, they're not wrestling, trying to figure out how to... They, they are flying in the face of everything you have told us as your people, in, in his context, as Israel, as the people of God, the covenant community. They're all supposed to realize they're servants. And he's like, uh, these people are, are lording it. They are not servants at all. They've completely broken your law. They're not servants. They're, and, and they're ruining people's lives. They're, they're ruining, I mean, enemies. This is language of like extreme stuff, right? He's like, this is, this is it's, got, it's just too much. And he's just, he's just telling the Lord, he's just like, Lord, I need you right now. I need you right now. And I don't know if you, I, I think you probably have, but I don't know that everyone has gotten to a legitimate place like this, but there are legitimate moments when you know like this cannot keep going whatever it is it could be something in your relationship something you know um that's happening to your child something that's happening you know with a spouse something that's happening at work you know i mean it could be something in your family it could be something but there are moments in which you're like uh all right no it's done let's stop stop everything stop this is not. This is, has to stop, Lord. Lord, I need you right now. This has to stop. This can't keep going. We can't keep pretending that this is just some normal thing. Oh yeah, that's what. Uh, you know, no. Something. There's certain moments. There are certain moments when you're like, I know this is so wrong. This needs to stop, Lord. I need you to act. And 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 you know when we feel like, man, as a servant, can you can you do that? <laughs> can you? Can you speak to your Lord that way? But man, think about what Jesus says when he's like, uh, be like that woman who just constantly is like knocking on the judge's door, pleading for help because, because something is going terribly wrong and she's being treated unjustly, that she has a cause that needs addressed. He goes, be like that in your prayer life. My friends, okay, when the Lord says, hey, when something needs to stop, when something is too far, when it's too much, when you're at a breaking point, don't pretend you're not. Don't pretend this is all, oh, this is fine. This is what people do. Don't excuse it. Don't be like, well, we're in a pandemic. Everyone's under a lot of stress. So, of course, that person's going to do that. Like, if, if there's certain moments, and, and I think the discernment right beforehand is not a bad idea, but there are certain things at certain moments in your life, and I don't think there's many of them, but there are certain moments in which you're like, this is wrong. This has to stop. This has to stop. And it's not, and I know how to make everything right. Instead, it's, Lord, I need you right now. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, I need you right now. I need your help right now. I need you to intervene. I need you to act. I need you to intervene. I need you to act. You are my Lord. You are my protector. You are my rescuer. You are my shield. You are my refuge. You are my strength. You want the good. You want justice. You want, you want righteousness to prevail. Lord, please act. Please stop this. Please intervene. Please. This cannot keep going. There are moments, my friends, when the servant of the Lord cries out to the Lord in those terms. Don't abuse that. Don't overuse that. Don't be like, oh, I'm inconvenienced. I'm stressed out. I've caused a lot of problems in my life that I know actually I could kind of actually work on, but I'm just going to ask the Lord to magically. No, there are moments when you know the Lord has to intervene or, or this is going to be terrible. And in those moments, the courage of a servant whose Lord is good and just and has unfailing love, the courage of a servant to speak that truth in that moment, to plead for the Lord's immediate help and intervention. Jesus says, pray that prayer and pray it again and again and again and again and again. And don't stop praying that prayer until you see the hand of the Lord in the land of the living. Brings it home, verse 127, 128. He says, I love your word. I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. Each of your commands is right. That's why I hate every false way. Similar to what we looked at the end of last week. The servant will obey even if they don't understand. But a servant of King Jesus, 
is a servant of a good and patient, unfailingly loving God who has saved us from our sin, redeemed us from death, and has brought us the good and abundant life. A servant of the Lord Jesus, a servant of the Lord Jesus, does not merely just want to obey because, but that servant wants to understand, wants to discern, wants to grow, and ultimately that servant, that servant, that doulos, that servant that Paul says he is, that servant that Peter says he is, that servant that the book of Acts says the early church is, that servant that John in the book of Revelation describes the saints as, that servant, that servant loves the Lord, loves his word, loves the law, doesn't need someone else to continue to remind them that you, know, you need to listen to the word, you need to make time for the word. But that servant grows in their affection for their Lord because this is a Lord, this is a master, this is a king like no other. King of kings, Lord of lords. There is none higher and there is none who represents all that is good, who is love itself. Man, as you live in the relationship of a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ, you love more and more and more who he is, what he says, what he asks you to be, what he asks you to obey, what he tells you to, to treat others with, what he says about his care for this, is the future of that. You, you love his word. You grow in affection for his word. You get excited about Sunday morning getting into John's gospel and hearing the words of Jesus and saying, that's my Lord. I am his servant. I love him. I love his word. Everything I am is oriented around my life, is given in service to him. I want to be a great servant to this great God, to this beautiful, kind, powerful, and good Lord. Like that ending of, I love your commands more than gold. Each of your commands is right. It's not just beautiful. I see how they're true, how they're just, how if people obeyed your word, they would treat one another well. Life would unlock. Things would flourish. Relationships would be healthy. Marriages and families and workplaces. We would have a right relationship to our work, and it wouldn't be crushing, or we wouldn't be slothful. We would have a right relationship to one another where we're not expecting them to be our God, and we can just love them with patient, non-political, non-bookkeeping love, sacrificial, perfect love. Like, that, if you see your life is not sometimes as a servant, but it, your life is fundamentally as a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not a heavy yoke and some cruel obligation. It is an easy and a light yoke. It is a blessed life. It is a life that increases as you understand, discern, and obey, increases in love. The last question, and then we'll close in prayer. This last year, could you say for the state of your relationship with the Lord that maybe because of the trials, maybe because of the catastrophes and the challenges, maybe, maybe because of the delay in fixed or rescued or or moved on from, maybe because of those things, would you be able to say that your love of the Lord has grown stronger? That, that your love of his word has increased? And I, I don't want you to, you know, it's not a manufacturer. This is an honest question that you have to answer in your own heart. No one can answer for you, and it might take some time to reflect on that. But as a servant of the Lord, is our love for our Lord Jesus growing in this last year from March to March? The state of our relationship, would you be able to characterize the state of your relationship with Jesus, your Lord, as a relationship that is increasing and growing in love? Love first and foremost for the Lord and his word. And then of course Jesus says what flows from there, loving your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, if anybody hearing this feels the ache or the pang that, that maybe they have left that first love, that maybe they, 
maybe they're obedient uh, by and large or obedient from time to time but but maybe the the love of the Lord has gone a little cold this last year because life and its its thorns has sort of choked out that love or or the distractions and the worries and the cares of this life have, have choked out that love. I pray, Lord, that that anyone hearing this would be encouraged that because our Lord has unfailing love for us, there is a chance, an opportunity, and even more a promise that even now, if we were to turn back to you, recommit ourselves to you, start to pray the prayers of a servant of you, um, that that love is going to be renewed. And it can grow and grow and grow, and it can grow without limit and without end. So I do pray, Lord, that even if we're struggling through asking some of these tough questions about the state of our relationship with you, I pray that from here forward, maybe from this March to the next one, <laughs> maybe maybe from this March to the next one, we will be able to say, man, I really, I can really see that I was able to grow as a servant of the Lord, that I was able to grow in these ways, that I was able to grow in my understanding in that relationship. And I do pray, Lord, that you would show us how to live a life of a living sacrifice, our reasonable service, that you would show us how to serve our spouse, serve one another, serve our children, that we would, you would show us how to love with the servant love that you showed us when you were here on this earth, that you asked us to imitate. Teach us, Lord, to love one another with that sacrificial love. Teach us to be the neighbors that will be there no matter what for the sake of the good the righteous and the just cause. Thank you so much for your church. I thank you for the work you're doing in the lives of those who are a part of Zoe and for the work you're doing in the lives of all who know you as Lord. And I pray this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Uh, not two hours, Zach. Hour and 20. <laughs> um, thank you uh, for uh, thank you for your patience with me. Uh, that's some evidence of, of something. Um, the Lord loves you so much, um, and and I do pray that you you are able to see a little bit more um, how good it is to be a servant of this Lord. Um, as always, if you have to go. <laughs> as, I, as I see the church mice scurrying um, I love what Allison said about um, the church mice uh, in our garage um, coming to hear the word and then as soon as I look around <laughs> they scurry away sermon was not so good <laughs> <Die>. <laughs> um, but, but uh, if you have to go go in peace my friends and God go with you